Started out working on the uh, on the Internet Engineering Task Force in 1990. Um, was elected, selected to be one of the managers in the IESG Internet Engineering Steering Group in about 1993, and was on the steering group for a decade. Also in 1993, I was elected to the ISOC board, and was on and was on the board for six years. Then became the ISOC vice president for standards a couple of years before. Uh, got off the board, then stayed as that in that role till '95, and then in '95 I became the secretary to the board, and I'm still am. So I've been on the ISOC board mailing list since 1993, uh, and worked in the internet space uh, in standards in particular uh, for for the decade there, and went in management, but also in just working groups and the like. I was one of the two people that uh, were given the task of coming up with IP Next Generation, which is now known as IP Virgin 6. And so, was, was involved. Uh, helped found NearNet, which was a regional data network in Northeast US. Uh, was the highest speed network at the time, uh, back in 88. And so, it's, it's been a fun time. I don't know if I was a key participant, I was a participant. Um, the breakthrough moment really was the, migra the, uh, the deployment of IP TCP IP on the ARPANET. Uh, I had gotten onto the ARPANET, Harvard had gotten onto the ARPANET in 1971. I had an account at that time. Uh, but the ARPANET in the early days was a network that connected computers together. In 1983, in uh, January of 1983, they deployed the TCP IP protocol on the ARPANET. And that switched it from something that was connecting computers to something that was connecting networks. So internet as in network of networks. That started in 1980, January of 1983. Shortly after that, with the development of uh, some of the regional networks from National Science Foundation, Harvard got um, connected up to TCP IP in in 83 time frame and then to the to it, the NSF net in 86 time frame and those are very important uh, eras because they proved that high speed packet networks would work uh, particularly the development of the deployment of, IP, of um, IP version 4 internet protocol version 4 meant that we were connecting networks together which allowed computers in various places to talk to each other rather than one computer at Harvard talking to one computer at Stanford. Just like the world, there, the world doesn't have a single, single type of weather across it. So the internet doesn't have a single type of weather. The, the, the weather forecast for the internet is mixed. Uh, we are at a very tough time right now. Um, the, for most of its life, up until certainly up until the late 1990s, um, most of the traditional world, traditional telecommunications world, the regulators and the um, standards parties completely ignored the internet because they thought it was a toy. They thought it wasn't useful for anything. It was only as the, as the usage exploded in the late 1990s that governments and regulators and traditional standards bodies became, began to really understand that it was something here. And they've been trying to figure out how to get involved in it since. And we are on a cusp of that. And that means that there's a storm front. Now whether that storm front is going to come over us or avoid us, we don't know yet. But certainly um, the chances are that there's risk. There's, there's significant risk of some very rough times for the internet as we know it. It'll be a different internet. The inter if, if the traditional standards bodies had developed the technology of the internet, it wouldn't be what we have today. It wouldn't be that you could set up a website. It would be that the carrier, the telephone company, could set up a website for you. And that's a different model. And that's the risk that we're in right now is that the governments want to control it. As we've seen by in Turkey in the last few days, in the, in the last few weeks, when when uh, the government gets poked, the reaction is to shut things down. And the developments in the political sphere um, risk enabling that.
biggest concern is is the one of regulatory impact. Uh, there is an lot, awful lot of governments in the world that that don't like the idea of citizens being enabled, of citizens being able to talk to citizens. Uh, they want to control the data flow, the information flow, uh, and that kind that kind of government would would, if they could, change how the internet runs. And in that context. Um, that would dramatically change our ability to actually communicate over it. So that's the biggest fear. The, the hope is that the people who are on the, on the ground, who, sees, who have used the internet, the kids and not so kids, that have been working on this, the, being enabled by it, communicating by it, whether it's social media or anything else, um, whose lives are built around that, um, will see the danger and will rally against it. I was having lunch at the Chinese restaurant in the hotel here on Sunday, I guess it was, and there was a, a young woman and two kids on the table next to me, and the kids were maybe three and four, the little girls, and one of the little girls was just buried in, this, in a smartphone, just zipping through it to try and uh, get something on it. And that's the generation which is enabled by this. And if the powers that be try to control it, trying to reduce what you can see and how you can communicate, one hopes, the hope is that those people and you and your generation will see that as a risk, will see that as a threat. Pay attention. You can't leave it to others. You have to pay attention that this is, while it's in the political sphere, it is politicians talking to politicians, trying to figure out uh, how to control this thing. It's in your future. It's in all of our futures, but you've got more of a future than I. And so it's more important to you to keep track of this, to see what's going on and to speak up and to agitate and to understand what's, what's at risk.